want to continue uh, looking at foreign policy from uh, the turn of the century uh, and through World War I. First, we looked at those factors that contributed to the establishment of, a, uh, of an American foreign policy by the turn of the century, and we termed that overall foreign policy uh, the open door policy. Then we looked at the individual uh, approaches to foreign policy, both by Theodore Roosevelt, whom we dubbed his foreign policy as cowboy diplomacy, or as some called it, big stick diplomacy. I wanted to mention that Roosevelt's participation in the settlement of the Russo-Japanese War uh, resulted in Roosevelt being actually given the Nobel Peace Prize in 1906 for his efforts in bringing about an end to uh, the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, it's interesting because Roosevelt always saw himself really as a warrior, not much uh, as a peacemaker, uh, and he gets uh, the Nobel Peace Prize for it. But clearly, though, I think if we want to define the characteristics of Roosevelt's foreign policy, I think that clearly uh, the, most, the two most conspicuous characteristics of his foreign policy were one, uh, aggressive uh, and internationalist that Roosevelt really embodied all those factors that we factors talked about, a, an understanding, a keen understanding of events taking place in the world uh, along with it, the, the Secretary of State, John Hay. Uh, obviously, as we looked at Roosevelt's foreign policy, there were a number of things that we probably would have disagreed with in terms of his approach. But still, in spite of that, Roosevelt believed that America had to fulfill its second new manifest destiny uh, and spread its influence around the world, which he did. Whether or not we approve of it or not, that was Roosevelt's philosophy, and that is how Roosevelt pursued his foreign policy. On the other hand, we looked at William Howard Taft's foreign policy. And to some extent, I think Taft's foreign policy suffered from the same problem that Roosevelt's, uh, that his domestic foreign policy suffered from. Uh, and that is, it's clear that Taft does not have the ability to push through his objectives, either in domestic policy or in foreign policy. As I indicated that for all practical purposes, the major architect of Taft's foreign policy was his Secretary of State, Philander Knox. And indeed, Knox's foreign policy reflected Knox's mentality, and that was of a corporation lawyer. In practice, in his private life, he was, by training, a corporation lawyer. To uphold the open door policy, to pursue America's interests, both in the Western Hemisphere and in the Far East, Knox created a foreign policy that on paper seemed shrewd, seemed enlightened, and it certainly seemed that if it could be implemented successfully, it would fulfill the needs of America's open door policy, and that is to make sure that in the Far East in particular, that America's dominance as an economic power would allow it to influence political events in the Far East. Knox believed that 
the foreign policy, the, even the entire State Department, should be reorganized in such a way that every diplomat saw himself as a salesman, a salesman who would identify sensitive areas, areas of tension and areas in which American foreign policy or American economic interests were at stake. When he identified these sensitive areas, he would then recommend that the U.S. would supplant, as it was said, Roosevelt's bullets with American dollars. He believed that if America infused American capital in these sensitive spots, by the infusion of American capital, American, America would be able then to dominate the political landscape in that country, in those countries. In particular, it would at least not allow, in the Far East and in China, would not allow the European and Asian countries to continue to exert an enormous influence in the Far East in terms of trade uh, and uh, political control. It was his way of maintaining the open door policy. It was called, as I indicated, as I dubbed it, uh, it was dubbed dollar, dollar diplomacy, obviously. The problem, again, with Taft's foreign policy, and it is not all that successful, certainly in the Far East, is that Tav and Knox did not take the time, did not take the effort to really consult American bankers to see indeed if they were really interested in investing capital in the Far East. Often, in fact, American investment in those two adventures, those two ventures that I mentioned the last time, the, the consortium and the attempt to refinance the Chinese debt to get rid of the Japanese and the Russians, who, uh, whom the Chinese owed a great deal of money to. By refinancing the Chinese debt, they would, in essence, quote, smoke the Japanese and the Russians out of China, and thereby maintaining an open door policy, thereby maintaining uh, the political uh, and territorial integrity of China. The idea is certainly good. There's nothing wrong with the concept, except what we find out is that American bankers who really don't have much money invested in the Far East before these two uh, ventures are not really anxious to pour great sums of American dollars in the Far East to maintain American foreign policy. And so, even after Taft uses American prestige and American power to get the consortium first to allow it in the Huquan Railroad that I, that I talked about yesterday, the consortium, American bankers are clearly not that interested and will not funnel enough money in it. Uh, uh, and in fact, the expedition will end, or its participation will end in an embarrassing manner. Likewise, American bankers are only half-heartedly interested in refinancing the Chinese debt, pouring money into China, giving loans to China to repay their debts to the Japanese and the Russians to get them out. This, too, fails because of the lukewarm interest on the part of American bankers uh, to achieve dollar diplomacy. In the end, what it leaves America, it leaves America embarrassed. Uh, 
And it arouses even more the suspicion of the Russians, but in particular the Japanese. Because the Japanese see the attempt to refinance China's debt, to force their presence out of China as a backdoor repudiation of the root Takahira agreement that we talked about. An agreement in which both the Japanese and the Americans agreed to support one another's possessions in the Far East. And lo and behold, we have the Americans in 1911 trying to push us out. That will only drive, interestingly enough, the Chinese and their enemies, the Russians, closer together uh, uh, in, in order to now perhaps oppose the U.S. Yes. You said that um, there was the, the Americans were trying to push us out. Are, are you talking about the Japanese were trying to push us out? The Americans are, uh, are, the Japanese are concerned that the Americans are trying to push them out, okay? And, and by pushing them out, the Americans have betrayed, in a sense, uh, the principles embodied in the Root Takahira Agreement of 1908. So, in the end, we don't really have, I think, uh, a successful foreign policy uh, under TAF overall. Uh, although it is certainly great on paper, uh, it is not translated uh, into any real practical results. Theodore Roosevelt was very critical of Taft's handling of foreign policy. Uh, by 1911, he is outwardly and publicly critical of Taft's foreign policy. But I think that also coincides with the growing hostility between Taft and Roosevelt over who will seek the Republican nomination in 1912. So that's, I think that's also part of it too as well. Now we turn our attention to Woodrow Wilson's foreign policy. As Taft leaves office in 1912 and we have the election of Woodrow Wilson. I recall once an historian commenting that ironies are the ways of history. That ironies are the ways of history. And I think perhaps indeed that is the case for Woodrow Wilson's foreign policy. Because indeed, Wilson had virtually no foreign policy experience to note. What limited ex experience he had in politics was in domestic policy as the governor of New Jersey. But absolutely no experience in foreign policy. The irony is that in spite of that, it will be foreign policy which will overshadow Wilson's administration. It will be foreign policy that will consume the attention of Woodrow Wilson. I mean, to, just to give you an example of how unprepared or what Wilson thought about foreign policy when he became president. He appointed as Secretary of State none other than our friend William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan as Secretary of of state, as the man who would conduct American foreign policy. Well, Jennings, well, Brian certainly had no experience in foreign policy. So why would Wilson appoint 
Brian as Secretary of State. One was because he placed a low priority in 1912 on foreign policy. Not much was happening in that area except, as we will see, in Mexico. But mostly, he appointed William Jennings Bryan to this position because he owed him a favor. And what was that favor? It was Bryan who released his delegates to support Wilson in the 1912 Democratic Convention to give Wilson the nomination. A deal had been struck that he was to reward Brian later. And Brian will be appointed Secretary of State. What, what harm could that do? Brian was an interesting person, and almost immediately, Brian created a small stir within foreign policy circles. Brian's foreign policy, Brian was a, was a teetotaler. Brian did not consume alcohol, and Brian forbade the providing of alcoholic beverages at any state function. Well, I can tell you now that those who came to state dinners were not happy at all about being denied their wine and their beverages, their brandy and the rest, so they would have to come to these state dinners already quite fortified. <laughs> Indeed, someone made a sarcastic remark about William Jennings Bryan's foreign policy that we could call it grape juice diplomacy. Well, Bryan was, was an interesting person as Secretary of State, and there are a couple of things we... Beside, well, that, that's the other thing that he did that created some stir to as well. After Bryan became Secretary of the State, he still decided to keep his second job. Uh, and that was, he was a member of the lecture circuit, the so-called Chautauqua lecture circuit, in which he would simply go around giving speeches for a fee. Well, most people thought that was not really dignified for the Secretary of State to go around giving speeches for money while holding the office of Secretary of State. But Brian told people that he had bills to pay. And while it may not look uh, uh, stately, uh, he had <laughs> to work. Uh, Brian was, was interested. He had debts that he had accumulated from his past elections, so he continued to work uh, as a lecturer. The only other significant, well, there are, two, there, there are two other significant things that Brian will do before he will leave as Secretary of State in 1916 over a dispute with, Roosevelt, uh, with uh, Wilson about foreign policy. The one thing he will do will be he is a pacifist. He believes in the absolute neutrality of the U.S. in getting involved in foreign affairs. He has an interesting approach to foreign affairs. He instituted, during the years that he served as Secretary of State, a series of 30 treaties, 22 which actually went into effect with Latin and South American countries, treaties that were called cooling off treaties. Cooling off treaties. The reason they are called cooling off treaties is that Brian believed that really 
if people stopped to think about what they were angry about, if they stopped to think about what the issues were that brought countries both to the brink and over the brink of war, you could avoid most hostilities, fighting hostilities. He took an old, I guess, adage from his childhood that when one got mad, one's parents told the individual to do what? <laughs> that too. When you were mad, they would tell you to simply count to ten. And if you were very angry, the count to a hundred. Then the idea behind that is that if by the time you got to 100, somehow that impulse to hit someone, that impulse to strike, would have been replaced by a more calmer attitude. This idea is actually embodied in these series of cooling off treaties with America and the Latin and South American countries, that they would agree that whenever there was an issue that seemed irreconcilable, they would first wait a certain period of time to give cooler heads a chance to prevail, to cool off, if you will. And after cooling off, if they still felt compelled to fight, then that was another issue. But in the interim, they would use this cooling off period to diffuse issues. He believed that most of the conflicts in Latin and South America could be handled by these cooling off treaties. And in fact, it was 30 countries signed it, and in fact, it was put to the test 22 times during his time in office, and they were successful. But Brian's biggest problem, aside in terms of foreign policy, was his position on neutrality. It would be this that would force Brian to leave as Secretary of State to be replaced by Robert Lansing in 1916 because he would feel that Wilson's policy was unneutral in terms uh, of the uh, central powers. But let's look at Wilson for a moment because in the end, in spite of either Bryan or Secretary Lansing, Wilson as he had in domestic policy would largely and alone determine his own foreign policy. Here again, personality comes in to play. Wilson, like Roosevelt, is an incredibly strong-willed individual. And even when he is not right, he is still strong enough to succeed. Wilson's handling of America's participation in World War I will result in a victory for America during the war, but we will see his personality will hurt America in the post-war period. This very, this very same strength that would help America would also be the same strength that would hurt America in the post-war period. But it is that internal strength that both Roosevelt and Wilson uh, have that will uh, produce successful ventures in foreign policy. Some have dubbed Wilson's foreign policy as missionary diplomacy. 
missionary diplomacy. That term missionary diplomacy was particularly evident in Wilson's handling of the Mexican Revolution. We can see this missionary diplomacy. And part of, and what we must remember is that Roosevelt's, I mean, Wilson's foreign policy was largely shaped by Wilson's background. Wilson was a Calvinist. Wilson was a very religious man and always saw things in terms of good versus evil, right versus wrong. There was often very little gray when it came to Wilson's determination of virtually anything, and that was certainly true in foreign policy as well. The revolution in Mexico, the protracted revolution in Mexico, will clearly reflect his religious background and this sense of looking at things from a moral point of view. The revolution in Mexico, which the first phase of it breaks out in 1911, had actually been coming for more than 30 years. Since 1877, Mexico had been ruled by Porilio Diaz. Diaz was clearly a despot. And between 1877 and 1910, while Diaz ruled and the Mexican landowners became rich and wealthy, 85% of the Mexican peasants suffered and lived at a subsistence level. But the U.S. never criticized Diaz, and in fact, his rule had come to be known as Diazbatism by his critics, in a flippant way, pejorative way, Diazbatism that America did not criticize Diaz because even though he was a dictator, there was stability in Mexico. Stability that made it a good place for Americans to invest. Okay? In spite of the human rights violation of 85% of the population, American presidents really took a hands-off approach to the internal affairs of Mexico as long as American interests were safe. By 1911, there was Americans had invested more than one billion dollars into Mexico. Men like William Randolph Hearst, editor and owner of the San Francisco newspapers. Hearst, in fact, owned a ranch in Mexico about the size of Rhode Island. <laughs> Huge ranch. He had inherited a ranch about the size of Rhode Island in Mexico. Hertz, as you will see later, will agitate to get the Americans more involved in the Mexican Revolution as American property becomes threatened in the revolution. 
Well, the first phase of the revolution will come in 1911 when Diaz will be overthrown by the revolutionary Francisco Madero. Francisco Madero. Who believed that his revolution would bring democracy to Mexico. That by overthrowing diaspotism, that it would bring about democracy and a better way of life for the 85% of the Mexican population who indeed were poor and suffered under the yoke of the Spanish, of the Mexican landowners. But the Mexican landowners were not about to allow a democratic revolution to take place in Mexico. So within a year of Madero's presidency, he would be assassinated and overthrown by an individual who on the surface, prima facie on the, on the surface, one would think would have championed the 85% of the Mexicans who were of Indian blood because he was a full-blooded Indian who had come from poverty and hardship. This full-blooded Mexican Indian by the name of Victoriano Huerta allied himself instead with the large Mexican landowners. He, with the backing of the landowners, will overthrow Madero and he becomes, Huerta will become president now of Mexico. This will occur as Wilson becomes president of the United States. Now, what most Americans would have done, most American presidents, Taft certainly did it during his administration, would have simply either stayed out of it or would have recognized Victoriano Huerta if, in fact, he promised stability and the protection of American private property and interests in the country. And indeed, that's what he did. He said he was going to restore the same, the, the same stability that had existed under diaspotism. And so he asked for American recognition of his legitimacy as the president of Mexico. But Wilson refuses to recognize him. Wilson knows that Victoriano Huerta has murdered Madero. And he will not support a presidency conceived in assassination and blood. He will not recognize Huerta. Indeed, what will happen is that Wilson will instead champion by 1913 two individuals who claim to be following in the footsteps of Francisco Madero, that they are revolutionaries intent on, again, creating democracy 
and freedom in Mexico. These two individuals would be Venustiano Carranza and Francisco Villa, later known as Pancho Villa. Now, both are partners in trying to overthrow Quelter. Wilson will in fact support Carranza and Vila. He will allow shipments of arms. At first he had prohibited any shipment of arms or any, uh, or, or any of the warring factions to buy armaments from the U.S. But Wilson was absolutely upset about the way that Victoriano Huerta had come to power. And w Wilson publicly made the comment that he wanted to show the Mexican people how to establish a righteous government. That he wanted to teach and show the Mexican people how to establish a righteous government. Again, this sense of moralism intruding. So he will support Carranza, and indeed Carranza and Quelter, I mean, I'm sorry, strike that out. Carranza and Vila will overthrow Victoriano Quelter, and he will become President Carranza of Mexico. Well, everything should be just peachy by 1914, should it not? But it isn't. And the reason it isn't is because Francisco Villa is not content to play second fiddle to Carranza. He wants to be president of Mexico, Mexico. He breaks with Carranza and he now begins to conspire to bring the U.S. into conflict with the Mexican government. In January of 1916, in a place called Santa Yestobil, Mexico, 18 American engineers will be murdered by sympathizers to Francisco Villa. 18 American engineers. If that was not bad enough, Vila himself and his followers will cross over into New Mexico in March of 1916, where they will kill a number of Americans. Well, the Wilson cannot tolerate that. And Wilson will then, first he will ask Carranza. Carranza, by the way, at, at this point, Carranza is very sympathetic with the U.S. He, is, he has opposed Francisco Villa's actions. He has denounced his murder of the 18 engineers in Santa Yestapa. He has given Wilson permission to allow a limited American action in Mexico against Francisco Villa. He assumes 
that this American action would indeed be limited to crossing the border and capturing Francisco Villa and bringing him to justice to trial. This limited expedition will begin under one of the more colorful American uh, generals, General Black Jack Pershing, who was really everything that people said about him. He wore two pearl-handled guns. He was really something. He was, you talk about a figure cut out of sort of the, the 19th century old west. This was, he would have done any, he would have done Jesse James, any of those other cowboys, justice. I mean, he was something. He decides that he cannot limit his action to simply crossing the border for a few miles. He will violate, as he cross, crosses the Mexican border into Mexico, he will violate the rights of any Mexicans that he comes into contact with. There will be altercations. There will be killings. In fact, General Pershing will drive, he will almost, at one point, he almost captures Francisco Villa. Almost, he almost gets him, but he fails. But in the process, he will penetrate 300 miles into Mexican territory. 300 miles. Even Carranza is now bitter at Wilson for allowing this general to violate Mexican sovereignty in such a flagrant way. In fact, all of Mexico is angry now at Wilson for allowing Black Jack Pershing to penetrate 300 miles into their country, violating their national sovereignty. Wilson, in fact, understands that he's gone too far and he will recall Pershing. But by that time, the damage has done, has been done. In the end, you will even have a shooting war between Mexico and America at a place called Veracruz. Mexico, in which the Americans will eventually simply uh, take over the custom house and actually uh, capture the entire town. That incident in the latter part of 1917 will be ended by mediation from the so-called ABC powers, Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. But even though they will leave uh, Veracruz, when they leave, they leave behind an incredible amount of hostility toward the Americans. On the part of even Carranza, who has supported the U.S. and had been supported by Wilson from the beginning. Indeed, Carranza is so bitter that Mexico, during World War I, will become a breeding ground for anti-American sentiment. It will, become, it will become a breeding ground for German intrigue. The Germans will try to exploit this hostility on the part of the Mexicans toward the Americans. As we will see, they will really exploit that eventually in what we will talk about later will be the Zimmerman telegram. But we'll get to that uh, in a moment. So the upshot of this is that the Mexican Revolution, this protracted revolution, will leave 
by the time that World War I breaks out, and Wilson really cannot spend too much time with Mexico. He, he does not want a war, an all-out war with Mexico because of events taking place in Europe. And what is taking place in Europe? The unspeakable. The unthinkable. What had, what John Hay and others had been concerned about as early as 1899 came to pass in 1914. The result of a continual arms buildup an arms race between countries, this desire for overseas possessions to strengthen their own nation state positions, entangling alliances and detente finally exploded into World War I with the assassination of the Austrian Duke Franz Ferdinand. War broke out in Europe in 1914. Well, what was America's position when the war broke out in 1914? They were already involved in the Mexican affair When war broke out, it is clear that most Americans are simply happy and grateful that their forefathers had the good sense, as the newspaper put it, to leave the old world lunacy 300 years earlier that these European countries had reverted to the state of savages. The New York Times put it, roaming through the land drunk with ambition and the quest for power. And that the U.S. wanted no part of this old world lunacy. Wilson will immediately call upon the American people to be both neutral in thought and in action. He asked the American people when they were in theaters not to cheer either the Allied side or the central powers. But the problem with Wilson's stance on neutrality and asking the Americans to be both neutral in thought and deed was impractical because of the sympathies of the various groups who made up the American melting pot. There were people who were of English descent, of French descent, who supported the Allies and were not quiet about their support of the Allies. There were those who immediately in the public wanted the U.S. to take an unneutral position to support a small number, the Allied powers. Or as one person put it in a poem, forget us, O oh God, lest we forget the sacred sword of Lafayette. Remember during the American Revolution, the French under Lafayette, General Lafayette, had come to the aid of the Americans in their war against the British.
So, even though they were asked to be neutral, people took sides. Even Wilson himself, it has been argued unconsciously, favored the Allied powers. I think I mentioned to you that Wilson admired the English. That Wilson even, in fact, in his dissertation, wanted to remodel Congress to make it more like Parliament. He envisioned the presidency as more like a prime minister. He hung over the his desk in his office, the picture of Gladstone, a famous prime minister of, Eng of England. He had wooed his wife. He had courted his wife with poems of Burke, readings from Tennyson, and others. Could Wilson then, with his love for the, uh, for the English, stay neutral? Was neutrality possible? Well, the answer probably is no. There will be several factors that will inexorably draw America into the conflict, even though at the outset there is no evidence that the U.S. wants to get involved in this conflagration in Europe. Let's look at some of those factors. I think the first factor that we should mention, and perhaps this first factor will be the deciding factor, although we'll look for other causes. And maybe I could just list them to you now, the major theories why the U.S became involved in World War I, and then we'll go through each one. One, there is this theory that America became involved in the war because of commercial interests. It was a banker's war. Well, we'll talk about that in a moment, a banker's war, that America became involved in the war because of commercial interests. Secondly, there is the theory that Allied propaganda so incensed the Americans that eventually they came became so outraged that they wanted to enter the war on the side of the Allies. We can dispense with that now. Basically, propaganda had very little to do with it at all. The third reason was the use of the German U-boat or submarine. U-boat diplomacy, we could call it was a major factor in bringing the U.S. into war with the Central Powers. I think in terms of hindsight, the first, the first and the last one will be the determining factors which will get the U.S. involved in war. What about this banker's war? Between 1914 and 1916, the first two years of the war. Now, this is also important for the U.S. When war broke out in Europe, economically, the America, America was a debtor nation. That is, the U.S. owed countries money. Okay? 
But by the end of the war, for the reason I'm getting ready to talk about now, by the end of the war, the U.S. would emerge economically as the strongest economic in the power, I mean power in the world. It would no longer be a debtor nation. It would be a creditor nation because of enormous trade between the U.S. and the Allied powers. And that is the point. Between 1916, I mean, between 1914 and 1916, there was an enormous amount of trade in which the U.S. provided goods, war implements, and materials to the Allied powers. While the U.S., however, was was engaged in this great trade with the Allied powers, they would not trade between the U.S. and Germany continued to fall to the point that by 1916, two years later, they virtually had no trade with the German powers, the, the central powers. So what does that mean? Well, for one thing, let me, let me point out, most Americans did not like the Germans. The Germans always seemed to the Americans to be too aggressive. They believed in real politik, blood and guts politics. They believed in power and brute force. The German Otto von Bismarck criticized Wilson, Wilson's morality. He says, what does morality have to do with foreign policy? He said, Mor moralism is fine, but does it pay dividends? <laughs> and when the Germans invaded Belgium and Bismarck tore up the treaty with Belgium and referred to it as a scrap of paper, the Americans did not trust the Germans. So, perhaps this natural reaction we have by 1916, an incredible situation in which both in terms of trade and loans that the U.S. will provide, the House of Morgan, J.P. Morgan, will provide millions of dollars in loans to the central powers by 1916 to help them prosecute the war. Well, theoretically, by 1916, some have argued the U.S. was wedded to the Allies. That the giving, the providing of materials and loans cemented the U.S. to the Allied cause because if they lost, what would happen to U.S. loans? They would not be repaid. They could not financially afford to see a loss by the Allied powers. That is one theory. And I certainly think it has some validity. The other was the notion of U-boat diplomacy eventually would bring the U.S. into war against Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I think the use of U-boat diplomacy as a reason is very complicated. I think on the one hand, clearly, it is a precipitating factor. On the other hand, too, it is also a complicating factor in how Wilson will perceive the use of U-boat diplomacy. One of the real problems is that this is a modern war. Wilson will look at the war 
from a 19th century international position, not taking into account the 20th century realities of warfare. And in the process, by looking at it this way, he will hold the Germans more accountable for certain practices than he will hold the Allies. For instance, when the war breaks out in Europe, the first thing that the English will do, and they had learned this a long time ago, in fact it had been instrumental in the defeat of the French as early as the French and Indian War, the Great War for Empire. that he who controls the seas is at a decided advantage to defeat an enemy. Because if you could control the seas and the waterways, you could do what? You could cut off the lifeline, the bloodline, which will sustain the war effort of your enemy. And who had the biggest navy in the world at this time? Great Britain, the most powerful navy in the world. They would immediately move to take advantage of that by declaring a blockade of Northern Europe around the British Isles and uh, other parts of Europe. This blockade would be designed to stop any flow of goods from getting to the central powers. Now, in the old days, in the 19th century, generally a blockade was established about three miles from the coast. You would search the ship for contraband goods. And what do I mean by contraband goods? Any good, anything that could be used to help the other side continue in a war. You would confiscate those goods and then you would allow the ship to simply proceed on. That was the, I'm simplifying it. But that was in the 19th century. That was when ships were fairly what? Small. Now you had these huge vessels that required far more than a few hours or even a few days to completely search. And you could not search these ships on the seas because you ran the risk of what? While you out there searching a ship for contraband who might just be swimming along and sink you. The Germans with the U-boat. That's, that's why we'll get into the U-boats in a minute. So what the Allies will do is that it will establish corridors which will force neutral ships, including Americans, to certain ports where they will take their time to search for us, to, uh, to search them. In the process, it will tie up American commerce and the commerce of neutral ships. Now, keep in mind that Wilson was upset about this because on principle, Wilson believed that neutral countries had a right to do what? To, to trade with whomever they pleased. But the reality was, that in spite of the inconvenience and the loss, which would be considerable, of American shipping as a result of the English blockade, the Americans did not, Wilson did not protest the way that he would protest the use of a German blockade that we'll talk about in a moment. And the reason, well, let me, let me, 
let me let me talk about this now too. Let's do both. The point is, the English can, even though they may have to now stop ships on the high seas and force them to care uh, to, to tread a narrow quarter to the ports where they're tied up for months, and sometimes you lose the cargoes. No one has lost their life in the process. The English have a big enough navy to truly enforce a real traditional blockade, even though there are some differences from the 19th century. In response now to the British blockade, the Germans will declare their own blockade of the British Isles. This blockade will be designed theoretically to do the same thing that the British blockade is designed to do. But there is a big difference between the two blockades. The British really are able to, inv to invoke a real blockade. The Germans will only be able to invoke a paper blockade. That is on paper. They do not have the Navy that the English have and the Allies. They're not able, they don't have ships to be able to conduct searches and to even steer ships to ports. They will rely on the invention of the German U-boat, the submarine, to enforce their blockade. But it is a blockade that is enforced by terror. What do I mean by terror? It means that they really don't intend to search ships for contraband. Any ship that is caught heading for the Allied ports, for the Allied countries, will be sunk by the British U-boats. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the German U-boats. I'm getting senile. the German U-boats. This will anger Wilson. For instance, in 1915, you will have the sinking of the British passenger liner, the Lusitania. More than 1,100 people lost their lives as a result of Lusitania being struck by a German U-boat torpedo. Of those more than 1,100 lives, 198 of them were Americans. Wilson was outraged. Yes. What year was that? 1915. I have a Lusitania here. 1915. Now, there's a. I'm going to tell you a little story about Lusitania in a minute too, because it, was, it wasn't as as as, as harmless as, as it appeared. Um, but Wilson was absolutely furious at the loss of 198 American lives and warned the Germans that the sinking of ships without humanitarian precautions, without warning, without the proper protocol of searching ships would result in a heavy price they would have to pay. Well, he doesn't really tell them what the price is, but he tells them they will have to pay a price. The Germans really don't want the U.S. in the war right from the beginning if they could avoid it. So the Germans will now begin to agree to a several pledges. The first will be the Arabic pledge, and the second will be the Sussex pledge in 1916. What this simply means is that you you have two ships that are sunk, and each one after each one 
the Germans will promise that they will take humanitarian precautions. They will search the ships and they will provide for the safety of the, pe uh, of the people aboard. But the truth is, that's impossible. The Germans were under orders to, to sink passenger ships, merchant ships, ships, merchant ships, unarmed, armed merchant ships. They were, they were instructed to sink any ship that was traveling to a belligerent country. And the reason was because of the fragility of the U-boat. They could not take the chance on surfacing, one, they didn't have the manpower to search these ships. And secondly, while Wilson was telling the Germans to take humanitarian precautions, the Allies, on the other hand, gave strict orders to merchant ships who were armed and passenger ships not to allow themselves to be searched by German U-boats. That once the U-boats surfaced, they were to shoot them and it didn't take much at this time to do what? To sink a U-boat. I mean, you raise about the water to get ready to be searched and pop. I mean, it was, I mean, you could almost sink one with a rifle. So it really sort of put the Germans, you know, at a disadvantage if in fact they really had any intention in the first place of taking care of, taking humanitarian precautions, which I don't think they did anyway. Okay, I don't think the history justifies that if you look at the record. But likewise, none of these other ships were going to allow the Germans to search them. Lusitania, for example. This wasn't just any old passenger ship. This ship had been secretly remodeled. Okay? It had been secretly remodeled by the British. It had been given these extra plates of steel to reinforce its hull. Why do you think it did that? To ram, to crack open U-boats. They were not going, and not only were they given this, this reinforced steel hulls to ram U-boats, but they were also, the, the ship was also refitted to give it an incredible speed for a passenger liner. So it could either outrun the U-boats or certainly when it hits them with such velocity and again with these, with these plates, they were also iron, uh, they were also armed, they would have sunk the U-boats. And they were given instructions not to allow any Germans to board them. So you had this kind of game playing with, with the Allies, too, as well. But Wilson now is holding, by 1916, Wilson has now, is now holding the German U-boat diplomacy completely accountable. And he allows the Allies to get away with simply holding up American ships, even with the loss of uh, goods. As the New York Times explained it, well, I mean, there's a big difference here. The difference is that we prefer to deal with a gang of thieves, the Allies, because they were taking their, their ships to the ports and, and, and losing profit, than to deal with a group of murderers. You could negotiate reparations for the loss of commerce with the Allies after the war was over. You could, you could recoup losses. But with the German U-boat diplomacy, you could not recoup what? The loss of lives. That becomes a difficult problem. That becomes where U-boat diplomacy really becomes a real problem. And especially when the Germans decide to uh, resume, as we will see in 1917, unrestricted submarine warfare. But in the meantime, it's, Wilson is also a man of great vision. 
as the war progresses, Wilson is not only trying to hold the Germans accountable for their, uh, uh, for their behavior and actions, but Wilson is also beginning to develop his own plans to bring about the end of the war. He believes he can bring this to an end. When we meet again, we'll look at Wilson's attempts to bring the war to an end on his own, the response to the Allies, and ultimately the U.S. entry into World War I.